Now, in A Prisoner's Dilemma, each person plays their dominant strategy. Nevertheless, they all end up worse off. They could have done better by cooperating. So, what happens when we're playing these games again and again? If it's a one-off situation, then typically people defect. They are not going to cooperate. But if they are involved in iterated plays of this, if I have to be involved in games that are prisoner's dilemmas with the same people over and over again, we start realizing that we're better off if each of us cooperates. And so cooperation can emerge in those settings. We face this question of strategy in a lot of settings in life. We're thinking about how to deal with people we have to deal with frequently. We're going to interact with these people a lot. Maybe at work, maybe within our families, maybe in our group of friends. And so the question is, well, how do we do that? How do we do that productively? Given that, we might be sometimes facing prisoners' delights, but often we're facing stag hunts or prisoners' dilemmas. How do we rationally approach that? Let's take the worst case scenario. Imagine that we're facing prisoners' dilemmas again and again, and we decide what's going to be our play. How do we deal with that sort of situation? Well, we formulate a strategy. We decide, here's my strategy for interacting with these other people. Given that we're going to be doing this again and again, I'm going to be learning more and more about them as we play these sequences of simultaneous games. So I want to know how to adapt, how to respond to what they've done on prior plays. That in general is going to be a question of strategy. How do I cope in an environment where there is mutual power? where the outcome of my action depends on what other people do. We want to prosper individually. We also want the group to prosper, especially if we're thinking about the welfare, not only of ourselves, but of our family, of our group of friends, of our company, and so forth. Well, here are a number of strategies generally recognized in the literature. This is far from all possible strategies. There are many, many, indeed, infinitely many possible strategies you could concoct, but these are some of the most popular ones. One of them, routinely a winner in tournaments, especially up to a certain point in the literature on this, is called tit for tat. The idea is this, we start by cooperating, but then we do what the other player did last time. So I begin by cooperating. If the other person cooperates with me, I cooperate again. But if they defect, if they refuse to cooperate with me, then next time I don't cooperate with them. But of course, we might be patient. We might say, well, should I retaliate? Yeah, we've got a history of cooperation, but this time that person betrayed me. Do I defect back? Do I decline to cooperate? Maybe, but maybe I think I'll give them a second chance. And so there is a variant of that, tit for end tats, you might say, where I decide, well, I'm going to retaliate, but I won't retaliate the first time. I'll give you one or two <laughs> mistakes. I'll forgive those, but up to a certain point, and then I'm not going to forgive anymore. I'm going to respond. So we start by cooperating, and we co cooperate then unless the other player has defected a certain number of times in a row. Of course, there are many other strategies. Here's one, just always defect. Look at the situation and say, look, uh, the best outcome for me is where I defect and you cooperate. So I'm going to try to lure you into cooperating, and I'm going to defect. And I'm just going to do that all the time. I'll stab you in the back every single time. Maybe you'll learn, maybe you won't. That's one strategy, and indeed there are people who play the game of life that way. They just defect all the time and behave entirely selfishly for themselves. Well, that means there aren't many opportunities for cooperation with such a person. To the extent that you cooperate with them, you simply lose. Another strategy is simply to always cooperate. Cooperate no matter what. Decide, look, I, I will forgive. You may sin against me once or twice or three times, or seven times, or seven times, seven times, I will continue to forgive. And so that's a situation where you cooperate no matter what. No matter what the history is, you cooperate. There are many other strategies, though. One Axelrod talks about is the Friedman strategy. You start by cooperating, but then you always defect after the first defection. So, <laughs> yes, I'm a nice person, but if you cross the line, I'm done. Now notice here, it says too many times. So you might wait until the nth defection to always defect. But in this case, the idea is, look, even once, I'll cooperate with you as long as you cooperate with me. But the moment you defect, it's over, pal. No more. And there might be some issues that you consider, hey, 
unforgivable betrayals. And then you're playing this strategy. Sorry, that betrayal was unforgivable. After this, I just defect. I refuse to cooperate with you. Here's another strategy that Axelrod refers to as the Joss strategy. Again, you start by cooperating, but then you do what the other player did last time, as in tit for tat, but occasionally, maybe 10% of the time or whatever, you sneak in a random defection. So this is a case where you mostly cooperate, but occasionally you try to get a little bit ahead. You think, hmm, yeah, in general, I'm trying to keep my contracts and my promises with you, but occasionally I'm going to sneak one in, okay? Occasionally I'm going to defect and hope you don't retaliate against me. So the idea here is I'm going to cooperate as long as you do, but occasionally I'm going to sneak in a jab. There are many other strategies. One might be just be random, okay? Flip a coin, do something random. Don't have any pattern to your actions at all. Now, at first glance, you might think that's a very strange thing to do, but there might be situations where it's entirely a reasonable thing to do. Let's suppose, for example, I am playing a game against someone else, and let's say it's a tennis game, and they're wondering where I'm going to hit the ball. It's good for me to randomize that to some extent. I don't want to be predictable. And the same thing might be true in various other competitive settings. I'm going to be at a disadvantage if you know what I'm going to do. Suppose we're boxing. I don't want you to know whether I'm going to try to jab with my left or my right. I don't want you to know whether I'm going to take a punch at all or whether I'm going to step back or do this. And the same thing can be true in lots of ordinary settings as well. I don't want you to know what play I'm about to call. I don't want you to know what kind of bid I'm going to put in on this contract. I don't know, want you to know exactly how I'm going to approach my application for that grant because I'm worried that if you know, you're going to be able to steal that information. So I'm going to be a bit random in my approach to things. If I'm too predictable, I can get into trouble. Here's another interesting strategy. I call it the bully strategy. The idea here is that you start by cooperating, but then you do the opposite of what the other player did the last time. So you cooperate with the stronger, roughly, you dominate the weak. Hence the picture of Nietzsche that I have here. This is something like master morality in Nietzsche. The idea is you find the weak, you dominate them like the lion. But on the other hand, you get a bigger lion, cooperate with a bigger lion. So this is well adapted sometimes to hierarchies. Cooperate with the people above you, but defect against the people below you. Now, that's not a very nice kind of boss. I've worked with people like this, and I've seen them rise in organizations. Sometimes, personally, it works out well for them. But on the other hand, eventually they get to a point where they anger enough people that they can't stay in that organization anymore. And sometimes that happens slowly over a period of years. Sometimes it happens pretty fast, and in general, the higher they go, the faster it happens. But it is a sort of strategy, and there are countries that pursue this in foreign policy. There are people who pursue this in personal relations. They are constantly judging you. There was a well-known person in our department who left and went to another university, ended up becoming very prominent. But I was told the first time I met him, listen, <laughs> never take a step back when you're talking to him. Stand your ground, and if anything, take a step forward, because he's going to move forward toward you and want you to step back. And the moment you do, he's established his dominance and he will dominate you. You're in trouble. So you've got to stand your ground or ideally show that you're stronger and then he'll cooperate with you. He was in effect playing this bully strategy. Most of the strategies we've looked at don't do as well as tit for tat in various tournaments where we take a variety of strategies and have them compete with one another. But this one actually sometimes wins over tit for tat. It's a highly competitive strategy. We could call it Pavlov. And the idea behind this one is a little more complex. We start by cooperating and we do what we did last time if the other player cooperated. If not, do the opposite. This one is a little bit harder to grasp intuitively because it says do what you did last time if the other player cooperated. That means if the other player cooperated, well, and you cooperated, then cooperate again. After all, that was highly productive. But if the other player cooperated and you defected, and therefore you gained a significant advantage, do it again. Hope he cooperates again. 
So in short, if the other player cooperated, then you're better off. So, hey, do whatever you did last time, it worked. That's the idea. See whether what your last play was worked. And so your cooperation worked because the other person cooperated, yay, do it again. If on the other hand, your defection worked because the other person cooperated, do it again. Okay, so see if it worked. But now, if the other player didn't cooperate, if the other player defected, then don't do whatever you did last time, do the opposite. So let's say last time they defected and you cooperated, then you got clobbered. Don't do that again, <laughs> okay? Don't cooperate again, defect. On the other hand, suppose you both defected. Well, then that was highly destructive for both of you. There were better outcomes out there. And so in that case, yeah, try cooperation. In other words, if the other player defects, basically you lose, you could do better by cooperating. So if the other player defects, then do the opposite of what you did last time. The play last time didn't work. And so try to do the reverse. So here's another way of putting the same point. You begin by cooperating, and then you cooperate if both players did the same thing last time, if both cooperated or both defected, but otherwise defect if the two players did different things last time. 